The U.S. Armed Forces, believe it or not, are entering their ninth year in Afghanistan and their eighth year in Iraq. So how do we best prevent and manage deadly conflict? How we facilitate, support, and sustain peace are increasingly important elements of American foreign policy. So Dr. Pearson tonight discusses with us how peace building can take the place of military action. For us, as we're finding out, military focus alone cannot ensure peace in all conflicts. And incidentally, because he, perhaps he'll define for us the word peace tonight, and uh, does, is that meant in a passive sense, or is it simply the absence of armed conflict? And uh, does it include the achievement of justice and stability in the region? Uh, Dr. Pearson, I know our executive director is uh, particularly pleased to have you with us tonight, as are we all, and we welcome you once again to Western Michigan. Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, one thing that you, you do mention, the Wayne State University Center, and uh, I may be permitted a shameless plug. I know we have some students here. Uh, we are, are now uh, moving into the area of offering a graduate certificate program in the very kinds of topics that you're seeing ton uh, tonight and in this series. It's the Graduate Certificate in Peace and Security Studies. And what that means is that students who go on to master's degrees either at Wayne State or any accredited masters. You could be over here in our rival institution in the GLIAC, uh, Grand Valley, I believe. Um, still, you can attach a certificate program to your master's study and get credentials in this area of study. So we think it's kind of an interesting uh, opportunity. We have for a long time offered an undergraduate program in peace and conflict studies, which is a co-major. That means you major in something else, you co-major in that with us. And the, the success of adding those credentials to students' careers is kind of remarkable. It does really open doors in diplomacy, in, uh, in areas of security management, even in private industry. So uh, we encourage people to uh, be, be uh, interested in that. 10 years, eh? it's a time flies when you're when you're having fun, and I did have fun here the last time. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again talking about an important topic because, of course, we are concerned uh, every day right now with the news coming out of Afghanistan as to what success our forces and our approach will have in moving towards some sort of stable, at least workable peace situation in that, in that troubled region, now often referred to, by the way, as AFPAC, which sort of conflates Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, t telling you something about how Washington sees that region now and the important interdependencies of conflict and peace in the two key uh, zones. So the thing sort of spreads. And uh, how to deal with these emerging conflicts and effectively uh, move to putting them to rest is, uh, is quite, a, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, I, did have a, I do have a new book that we've just uh, brought out on, um, it's called On Civil Wars, on analyzing civil wars. Uh, it's called uh, Civil War, uh, Internal Struggles, Global Consequences with the University of Toronto Press. And uh, one of the things in this book is a note that uh, civil wars, which, is, which are the essence of the kinds of conflict situations we are now talking about today, Afghanistan clearly has been one. Iraq deteriorated in, into one where we're sort of, again, confronted with how to deal with a situation like that. Pakistan teeters on the edge. We hope it doesn't degenerate into that level of conflict, of civil war. Um, but the, in the book, we sort of noted that uh, a change has taken place in civil wars. In the past, statistical studies showed, at least prior to the end of the Cold War, that most civil wars ended in military victory for one side or the other. We can think of our own civil war. Think back to it. Very troubled, long, prolonged, bloody conflict, interminable in many respects, testing the willpower and the resiliency of the two sides. President Lincoln determined to carry it on for the purposes of national reconstruction, reconstitution and unity of the Union and, of course, on the issue of slavery. 
Uh, and that war went on for five bloody years and ended in a military victory. And that was pretty well the model for how civil wars ended, coming right up to the end of the Cold War. But scientists and social scientists who have analyzed this, this phenomenon since that time have noted a subtle change, which is that today civil wars have tended to be more resolved by negotiated solutions, negotiated outcomes, outcomes short of total victory for one side or the other. That's not to say it always is this way, because we just had one settle, more or less, I think, settle in Sri Lanka last year with a pretty much walked to victory by the government side. A very, again, a very bloody ending, very high casualties. Went on for years. That war went on for 15 or more years. Uh, the American Civil War is short by today's comparison to how civil wars um, extend. But that seems to be the exception rather than the rule these days. Many of them have been settled or moved towards settlement by negotiation. We think of the one that's talked about, a couple have talked about in the book, Mozambique, Angola, although Angola was more or less a military victory. Uh, finally, though, the last forces that held out in Angola sued for peace, and there was more or less a negotiated outcome. So one of the reasons they think this is happening is actually has to do with the end of the Cold War and the sense that there are no, now other options possible on the table that can be utilized to try to reconcile the parties before they just um, go, to the, go to the mat completely and, the, and, and end in the, you know, the stronger one finally getting the, the nod over courses of like 15 years. And one of the things we found is that the UN has played a, a much bigger role in negotiations. We found that regional organizations like NATO or the European Union or the Organization of American States and so forth can intervene now with uh, greater alacrity, with more diplomatic uh, uh, flexibility. And one of the reasons for that is you don't see so many vetoes. You don't see such a Cold War paralysis on the ability of international organizations to potentially move into conflict zones. Look at Sudan. Sudan has ended its civil war tenuously, uh, but nevertheless through negotiations north and south, finally, after years of struggle, facilitated by outside uh, diplomatic intervention, pressure, and means that are di uh, you know, different from simply military means. And this is what we're getting to tonight when we talk about peace building and when we talk about the movement toward how, how you settle disputes, perhaps in, in ways that are uh, beyond and above just using military force, because we'll find military force isn't always the most appropriate method. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. But uh, Sudan is telling us that there are other ways. Now, that's not to say Sudan is a bed of roses. Uh, the southern portion of Sudan, which has entered into an agreement with the north, uh, this coming year will have a referendum on seceding. It's a little bit like Quebec. Uh, Quebec has this every so often. Uh, and Canada, thank goodness, has engineered it so that these things go on and the country survives. We're not sure about Sudan. And the stakes are high in Sudan because in the south is where they have identified most of the oil which has suddenly become a real issue in Sudanese politics. And this kind, of, this kind of emerging set of issues is what keeps conflicts going in many ways and has, causes them to reemerge. The possibility of new riches and who gets control of them. The possibility of water and who gets control of it. The economic dislocations and how do you solve them. These are very, very difficult and tricky problems and it will be in Sudan. Now, we also know about Sudan that there is, of course, Darfur, which is in the western part of the country and broke out after the north-south bargain was made. Many people feel by groups that felt disenfranchised in that, in that bargain, left out, marginalized. And the question of who's going to rule in the west, and there is more po potential oil there on the border with Chad in that part of Africa. 
uh, again, raises stakes for people and causes militias to be formed and causes very difficult uh, outbreaks of conflict and, and even civil war. So yes, we are moving in the direction of negotiated settlements. No, it is not a panacea. It is not easy. But there is this interesting new, new development. So I want to call that to your attention. And as we proceed through tonight, I think maybe the first thing we can do is do a little bit of definition work as to what do we mean by some of these terms we, uh, we hear and even see in, the, in this particular reading that's in this book, for those of you who had a chance to see it, on peacemaking. Because we hear different terminology. We hear uh, talk about peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building. And these, I think, have some useful distinctions that we should keep in mind because they tell us about the different stages of conflict and how you move through the stages to possible settlement. Peacemaking, what does that mean? Well, in order to keep peace or build peace, first you have to establish a modicum of peace in a region, in a zone. And what that means is bring the fighting to a halt. Um, by most definitions, peace uh, making involves maybe envoys and diplomacy by outsiders to try to encourage the parties to come to negotiations, at least treat each other in negotiations. One of the problems in civil war, of course, is the legitimacy pro question. If you negotiate with the other party, you have legitimized them. And for governments, it's generally a difficult thing to accept and negotiate with a insurgency group. There never actually were real negotiations between the North and the South after the Civil War broke out in the United States. It's quite remarkable, actually. The South tried to uh, sound it out for a while, and Lincoln said at one point that he would negotiate anything except the Union. And the, uh, the question of slavery in the, new, in the new territories. So there was supposedly room, but they never got around to negotiate. So peacemaking requires a ceasefire. It can require outside uh, mediation attempts. It, it, it creates at least a breathing space for further efforts to take place. And fighting can stop. Um, peacekeeping, often seen as another next step. Once you have some sort of ceasefire or armistice, how can you keep the parties from resuming fighting? Well, peacekeeping has a specific meaning. It means, in, in normal, in normal terms, it means sending troops either by major powers or regional powers or more likely by world organizations or regional organizations to try to patrol and keep the parties apart. There are two forms of peacekeeping that have emerged. One is a traditional form where the emphasis is on being neutral, having the troops arrive from neutral countries that are not suspected of having deep-seated interests in the, in the zone, in the area. For instance, Canada has a long and uh, varied history in peacekeeping, some of it good and some of it troublesome, as in Bosnia, they were present at some of the worst, uh, the worst human rights slaughters that Canadian troops had to, had to struggle and witness without, without intervening. When you intervene, traditionally, the tendency, the, the mission generally is not to take sides and not to actually involve yourself in military campaigns, but rather just to keep the parties apart, keep the roads open, give them an excuse to leave each other alone. So that's traditional peacekeeping. Countries like India, other neutral countries have had long and distinguished uh, histories with that. The blue helmets of the UN are famous for that. Newer forms of peacekeeping have uh, adopted what we call robust peacekeeping, where the missions actually have the right and the mission and, and the direction to involve themselves to actually enforce peace. Bigger units, bigger contingents, these were tried in some of the West African civil wars and in Sudan and Darfur. The trouble is the contingencies weren't, the, the group, the contingent of troops that weren't always big enough to handle the situation. But the missions were you can actually take part in fighting to repress either side that, that is uh, um, the aggressor. So robust peacekeeping is seen by some to be a more effective uh, 
um, uh, form of, of, of intervention. Problem is it risks uh, the question of sovereignty of the, of the host country. There is a presumption of sovereignty in international affairs, which we can talk about. So that's peacekeeping, the two forms. Peace building, the third of those uh, terms that we often hear, peace building, means pretty much creating conditions that can sustain peaceful relationships. You ask, what's peace? Uh, it's a very good question. We teach whole semesters on that question. Uh, it can mean, in the first sense, of course, uh, stopping violence on a long-term basis, no resumption of fighting. But we know, of course, that people's lives are sometimes uh, uh, subject to what we call um, institutional or structural violence, where there is and seemingly no justice for parties in a conflict situation. Uh, for better or worse, the argument of the Palestinians living in the occupied territories today is that their lives are um, deprived of justice. And therefore, the spark for violence recurs. Now, you can accept that argument or you can reject it, uh, but it is a, an argument that certainly is believed among many who sign up to struggle and to become insurgents in that conflict. Uh, that is a struggle for justice. If we're, if we're not treated equally, if we're, if we're treated as second class, if we're treated as powerless and dictated to, uh, the tendency for renewed violence can occur. So peace building has to deal with some of these psychological, political, and economic questions. For instance, it can involve disarmament of the parties. How do you keep peace? In Northern Ireland, for instance, if you think of the uh, agreement about peace in Northern Ireland, it entailed an insistence that the IRA disarm. Interesting that there wasn't quite the same emphasis on the Ulster Unionist disarming, uh, disarming but the uh, IRA factions did pretty well conform to allowing inspectors to come and see where they had or had not stored arms and that there were destructions of arms. So that can go a long way toward reassuring people that they're more secure, that they're less in, in danger, less in jeopardy, if mutual, hopefully mutual, disarmament can be, can be reached in a conflict situation. Reconciliation efforts and, re and, and reintegration of refugees. You'll, if you read this, the uh, article in, today, in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the booklet, they talk about the successful reintegration of some refugee communities which have fled and then come back. Um, this was a, an interesting test in, um, in, in Rwanda, for instance. <clears throat> I was just reading an article in the New York Times about Rwanda in which it's noted that there has been a good deal of reconciliation even though people had killed each other and their families had been slaughtered by the returning uh, refugees of the Hutu uh, community. Uh, there has been some forgiveness which is remarkable. And the article went on to explore the question of forgiveness and the human spirit and try to trace that, even to people who have suffered mightily at each other's hands. There is one form of just sort of uh, mutual uh, tolerance where you just leave each other alone and still hate each other. There's another form of resuming relationships and trying to build for the future, which is hard to do. But in South Africa, for instance, the truth and reconciliation process did lead to certain uh, degrees of reconciliation between the former rulers and the former insurgents, uh, now in power of the African National Congress. So again, properly conducted, these things can be quite moving and quite interesting. Economic development and sustainability is a third question for peace building. How do you make economies that are sufficient, that people have a hope and a future? In Gaza right now, one of the key problems is the lack of an economy. The lack of any hope for, for young people under the age of 20, uh, that their futures mean anything. Uh, as long as that disruption level exists, you have the potential for further violence, uh, we think, at least, as we observe these kinds of situations. So economic development, I mean, we see it in some of our own realm today in the state of Michigan, that people in economic uh, hardship begin to resent each other, begin to blame each other, 
immigrants get blamed, newcomers get blamed, minorities get blamed. Uh, it's a sort of a natural process that when you have no economic opportunity and you see others possibly getting something, you resent it. And this is one of the things you have to struggle against in peace building uh, activities. Uh, in Europe, this is seen today as well uh, with some of the immigrant issues that have arisen in Greece and France and uh, some of the other countries uh, in Europe. Security guarantees. How do you make people feel secure at night? How do you make people not desperate that their community and communal warfare is going to be uh, overridden, overrun in the night? You know, there were some very ugly scenes in Baghdad during the American um, uh, war uh, there uh, in which there was an equivalent of what we would have to call ethnic cleansing where neighborhood raids took place and people were kicked out uh, so that the neighborhood could be, could be uh, secured by Shia or Sunni uh, militias and people were kicked out of their homes and into other neighborhoods where they kicked other people out. This is an unfortunate uh, extreme that can occur in conflict, local conflict situations, and require uh, some sort of either acceptance of that new arrangement or reintegration where people can safely move back to their old neighborhoods. Some of this has not even happened after, after 15 years yet in Bosnia. So it's sort of frozen as separate, uh, separated parties. Security guarantees have to be provided, and I'll get to talk about that a little bit later, but one of the findings of the Civil War research is that the most effective uh, peacemaking peace uh, negotiation outcomes is when there is outside security guarantee. When an outside power, for instance, pledges that one party or the other will not be overrun in the final settlement. You know, that started in a strange way that people aren't even aware of in this country. How many of you are aware that American forces are in Sinai right now, in the mountains, passes of the Sinai Peninsula between Israel and Egypt? A few people might be aware, but most Americans are no longer uh, realized that the agreements of 1976 uh, and the Camp David Accords that have kept the peace between Egypt and Israel for all this time, despite provocations, and it's a, it's a cold peace. It's not a warm-hearted peace where they really accept each other. They have not reconciled fully, but they have not fought. And one of the reasons, perhaps, is that each relies on the fact that the United States agreed in that, in that negotiation to put troops in the Sinai to detect any attack by either party against the other, and if there were to be an attack, it would defend the... Uh, um, the victim. The United States is on record saying that it will defend the victim if either party attacks. So that, and this is another thing Americans probably don't realize, we're pledged to defend Egypt if Israel ever attacked e Egypt. And, and of course vice versa. So this may be the kind of thing that has to happen if a Palestinian settlement is ever reached. This may be the kind of security guarantee that would put people at more rest with each other so that they don't quite have to worry about each other's preemptive strike. Um, but it takes an outside power or a set of powers or organization to try to bring that, bring that to, to be. And finally, the last one that I want to mention about peace building is good governance and reliable rule of law. Because you don't really establish peace unless you have a government people believe in and at least trust to a certain degree. This is one of the key problems that we, we're going to see for a, a, in a few minutes when we talk about Afghanistan. Because the inability of that government to provide a, uh, a non-corrupt, uh, trusted uh, rule of law and uh, efficiency in most of the country is a key problem that is not, has not been overcome and is not likely to be overcome soon. So good governance, whatever that is, we're sometimes uh, despairing of it in our own country in certain local elections and so forth and so on. But still, we do a pretty good job. And um, 
we'd like to see that be a, a key for future and peace building in, in many countries. Somalia, for instance, doesn't have a government. There are countries with failed states, which are breeding grounds for further violence and which are very difficult problems in the emergence of some sort of peace efforts. Um, in connection with peace building, we now hear terms used that are interesting, the so-called distinction between hard and soft power. Hard and soft power. The United States is the leading hard power in the world, so to speak. Hard power tends to be seen in terms of military capability. It means the ability to, to use force and troops to solve or resolve or move on a certain situation. In some situations, this can be very effective. In fact, for instance, the liberation of Kuwait in 1990 by the first Bush administration was an appropriate situation for the application of what we would call hard power. Extracting, expelling an invading country from another country, doing it effectively and doing it quickly, the United States was able to do that. And so hard power was an appropriate means to that end. Uh, by the way, we spend more on this form of power, and the article makes this point, than on any other thing we spend on in this country. The de defense budget is the largest of the world, uh, the highest in the world. In fact, American military spending is greater than all the world's military spending combined. So we are, in the fact, uh, a pursuer of hard power, and we have a, quite a formidable force to do that. We can move troops as close as Haiti and as far away as Afghanistan in relatively short time spans. Now, that may not be soon enough for the people in Haiti, but still, it's pretty quick, pretty quick. And so that's a, that's a remarkable feat of logistics for hard power. Well, what's soft power? Soft power, it is argued, though, is sometimes more amenable to solutions in certain kinds of situations particularly political situations of conflict. Vietnam was a tremendous example of the ap applicability of hard power, but the inability of hard power to produce the result we sought. Now, some will say, well, we didn't use nuclear weapons, so that wasn't a good test, or we didn't go and invade the North enough, that wasn't a good test. But frankly, uh, the problem was a political problem in Vietnam. It was stated by the American government. How do you win the hearts and minds of the people? Winning the hearts and minds of the people. That's the first time we heard that phrase, which is still being trotted out occasionally, the hearts and the minds. You can't win a war in a civil war situation, it was argued, in an insurgency situ situation, unless you convince the people not to accept the insurgents and to accept the government. And all of the military capability that we had to, we could even replace the governments. We could even bring in one general after another, as we did in Vietnam, one colonel, one general, one air force, one, one you know, army officer after another. It didn't solve the problem, which was a political problem. And as the, the journalist of the time named I.F. Stone commented, how does Washington think it can win a peasant war on the side of the landlords. It was a very interesting comment. How do you win a peasant war on the side of the landlords? Because that's how basically it was seen. The United States propping up the pro-French, pro-Catholic, pro-landlord class of Vietnam against the peasantry, which was being organized and skillfully, some would say manipulated, by the North which was more popular than the South, and the peasantry was the mass. So that political equation, it is argued, was not very amenable to hard power. It, in fact, might have been more amenable to forms of soft power. What is soft power? Soft power consists of, every, every, of anything uh, that is the rest of your power base. For instance, your diplomacy, your e economic resources, your, um, today we would say, our internet capabilities, the ability to reach people, to network with people, our civil society groups, our rotaries, our Kiwanises, our 
our exchange programs. I mean, you may poo-poo that this is power, but if you stop and think about influence in the world, how does America influence people? It's very often by what they buy, what they, how they think, what they see, what they hear. And these levers of power, Joe Biden, Vice President Biden is quoted in this, in this article here as saying that, and he's an exponent of this, that non-military forms of power have to be exploited to a great extent more than they've been tried in the past in places such as Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it is true that the forces of General McChrystal are on call to bring benefits to the people as well as simply fighting the Taliban. There is a notion that we should provide some medical care. We are providing medical care in the world. Uh, there is a notion that we should provide some schools. There is a notion that we should provide some village water wells. The question is, should you provide that through the military, which are generally not trained to build schools, or should you try that through other means, such as allowing non-governmental organizations to, to take a role, such as creating the aid programs on a much bigger scale? We spend, most Americans, I think it's quoted in here, think we spend up to 25% of our budget in foreign aid. The actual figure is less than 1%. And how do people get that idea? Well, the article makes the point that they get it by simply an assumption, a set of assumptions as to what we probably must be doing that's being wasted. And it doesn't comport with the facts. So some people are feeling that, yes, you need military campaigns, but you also need a different approach to win hearts and minds. You'll never win them. And it was tried in Vietnam. I, I, I must say it was tried in Vietnam to have village reconstruction efforts. This is not new. It was tried to do what we call nation building in Vietnam. And it's not easy. And it's often seen as an outsider imposing some form of government, some form of activity on, the, on this population. I'm, I'm struck by remembering at Wayne State, we have a, a faculty colleague of mine who's in political science who was at, worked for the State Department in 1990, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, worked for the State Department in 2002 when the United States moved into Iraq. And her job was to formulate a public opinion poll when we first arrived in Iraq. Who else but the Americans would have a public opinion poll in their first days of moving into a country. That sort of speaks well of us in some respects. And the, and the poll was, what kind of government would you like? That was the question, more or less. What, and they gave a, a long list of possibilities, British parliamentary, American presidential, uh, Soviet, Marxist, uh, traditional Islamic. Um, they gave quite a list and asked people to choose. And you know the number one choice of the, and they did it as much of the country as they could possibly do across the ethnic lines, public opinion poll. They had it probably shocked people to be polled by, for their opinion on this kind of thing. And the number one option was, we don't need a model, we can do our own. We don't need a model, we can do our own. But it, which is interesting, by the way, because Iraq, if you stop to think about it, is a 3,000-year-old civilization, which was the first law-giving civilization on human record. The first civilization to have laws passed in the Code of Hammurabi, in the Babylonian history. So here we are, a 300-year-old country, coming to a 3,000-year-old civilization and asking them how they would like to be ruled. And they answer, well, you know, we could do it ourselves. Nice to think that. The second choice, you know what the second choice was? Second choice was United Arab Emirates. United Arab Emirates, who would have thought that? You know, the United, when, but when you stop to think of it, it makes rather good sense. United Arab Emirates, that's the Abu Dhabi, um, Dubai, uh, coastal, uh, federation uh, 
of independent uh, emirates or prince, princely states. Um, not always very democratic, not always very functional uh, parliaments, some, some more than others. Um, wouldn't live up to probably Western standards on uh, some aspects of women's rights, for instance. But it is, what is it about that that would have attracted the Iraqis? Number one, the word Arab. Catch that word? It means that it's indigenous to who they are. Not an implant of some other system, but an Arab system. Number two, it's a federation of disparate parts. And what have we learned about Iraq? We didn't know this when we went in. We should have known it when we went in. Tip O'Neill, whether you liked him or not, when he was Speaker of the House, he had a very uh, uh, basic uh, point about politics. Anybody remember what that is? All politics is local. All politics is local. So when you go a place, you really should study the local politics. The problem is, and the question is often, the great power goes in with global viewpoints. The major power goes in with global viewpoints. What, did we, what were we doing in Iraq? And what are we doing in Afghanistan? It is what? It's a global war on terror. I mean, that's one of the things we were doing in Iraq. But certainly in Afghanistan, we've talked about it as a global war on terror. It's how we see Yemen currently as another potential breeding ground for the terror network that we are really engaged with globally. Now, in the old days, it was a global war with communism, a cold war with communism. And we tended, and the Soviets tended to see every locality as a piece on a chessboard where you or the opponent will gain or lose. And so you have to control that piece, and you have to mold it, and you have to build it so it will be resistant to your global enemy. We've translated that thinking now, I think, into the global war on terror, which I think is somewhat of a misnomer. There is no single enemy on that, although there is a group that we certainly have identified as, as potently dangerous. At any rate, the local people think quite differently. The local people may be conscious of the global threats. They may not support global killing. But their main priorities are local in terms of who's, what ethnic group or what regional or territorial uh, splinter is taking place that they are resisting and fighting locally. If it's India, it's relationships between Muslims and Hindus and also other minorities, such as Sikhs, in different parts of the country that may or may not want autonomy. If it's Pakistan, it's relationships between the Waziri uh, localities, which resemble Afghanis, and the main cities to the east and south, which resemble India in culture, culturally. Tribal differences, religious differences in the case uh, of, of Iraq, religious differences, Sunni and Shia, and, and others, uh, Kurds, who are ethnically distinct and not Arab, don't consider themselves Arabs. They consider themselves a different tribal background, although they would, there would be probably some, uh, some slippage there, because Arabs speak Arabic. So you have these local conditions and the question of how best to deal with that locally with hard or soft power, soft power can sometimes be a more amenable solution when bringing people to negotiate with each other, when trying to formulate models that they could actually identify with, if it's the United Arab Emirates. One other aspect, by the way, of the Emirates was attractive to the Iraqis. It's rich. They're rich. They have made their oil in, in, income into quite a uh, monumental set of uh, cities and, and um, public, uh, public pro uh, projects. And they've done quite well for themselves. 
So this again would have some attraction. Unfortunately, as so often the case in Washington, I don't think we listened to that public opinion poll very well. Uh, one of the keys to conflict settlement, by the way, is listening. Not trying to simply say what you think should happen, but to listen to what the parties think has to happen. This requires some difficult choices. Sometimes you have to listen to people you don't like, or who seem threatening, or whose past has been checkered. But this requires a great deal of subtle diplomacy. Somebody like former President Carter, again, no matter what you may think of him, has been an exponent of this kind of uh, dialogue visiting conflict zones, trying to figure out the common ground if there is any, trying to make way for some sort of settlements, much to the chagrin of sometimes people back home who think he does too much or says too much or goes too far. So it's a very interesting question of how you deal with that. There's a woman a writer by the name of Mary Caldor in Britain, K-A-L-D-O-R, who's written a, a controversial view which to a degree I subscribe to, to a degree I don't agree with, but it's worth listening to, it's worth hearing, and her conception is new war. Mary Caldor has written about what she calls new war. Now some of this is not new. In international affairs you'll find that very little is new, totally new under the sun. We've seen almost everything before. I would say we've seen a situation like Afghanistan and Vietnam. Others would quibble with that. Uh, but nothing is quite new under the sun. First World War was started by a terrorist bomb in Sarajevo. 91 years later or so, that same city erupts in, in genocidal warfare. That same city, which had hosted, by the way, a Winter Olympics where there was supposedly a spirit of peace tragic, tragic consequences and th things that go around coming around again, partly because these problems have not been solved. The peace, the necessity for peace is to get to the root causes of a situation, often national conflict between people who resent each other, fear each other, or want the same piece of land. And the failure over time to actually resolve that, sometimes it's put in mothballs, in in Sarajevo was put in mothballs for a period of years by President Tito in Yugoslavia, who was able to rule in such a way that he balanced off these various ethnic groups and repressed those who constituted a threat. Interestingly enough, with American assistance sometimes, because we liked him better than Stalin. Communist. Tito dies. Situation degenerates. There is no such leader anymore. And no Nelson Mandela arises to be able to regroup and reconcile people. And so the situation goes to the old format again because the situation had not been resolved. Is there going to be a Serbia? Is there going to be a Croatia? Is there going to be a Slovenia? Who's going to rule it? What are, the, what are they going to do with the Bosnians? And within the Bosnians, what are they going to do with the... Uh, within Serbia, rather, what are they going to do with the Kosovars? None of this had been resolved, even though they had lived together fairly responsibly for a period of time. So that's a trick getting to the solutions. So what does Mary Caldor say about new war? Well, she says it comes, and Bosnia was her first example of new war, fought by militias mostly be, rather than uh, formal armies, fought between asymmetric powers, that means big and small, insurgencies, terrorists, and, and regular governments fighting each other in a, in a mix-up rather than at, in the usual way, we, in the American Civil War, the wars were battles. The Battle of Antietam, the Battle of Bull Run, the Battle of Gettysburg, a series of formal armed confrontational battles that you could count and see who won and count the progress of the war. Most wars were like that. Now, wars are not fought that way. There is no clear battle of any place in Afghanistan, although there are fight, there's fighting all in many provinces. And the, the, the structure of fighting is uh, referred to uh, by Caldor, 
the reason for fighting is to mobilize people. The aim of the war effort is to mobilize people. The point of the violence is not so much directed against the enemy, rather the aim is to expand the networks of extremism so that you can control more territory and gain more for your group at the expense of any other. But the, the, the enemies may shift, bargains may be temporarily formed, such as the Croats and the Serbs jointly agreeing to attack the Bosnians at one point then the Bosnians and the Croats resisting the Serbs at another point. And you have these kinds of informal struggles, non-state actors and militias, asymmetrical. Um, and it's all compounded by the informal, illegal, and resource-plundering economies. Again, not new in war, but the, di the blood diamonds in Africa that financed the wars and actually became one of the reasons that leaders wanted to keep fighting, because they could control the diamond trade and trade it for arms and trade it for money and trade it for uh, power. Uh, oil is controlled in this way in parts of Nigeria. Right now there's a concern about Nigeria because the government, uh, the leader, is sick. And they've just appointed the vice president under very controversial circumstances to try to take over. And he represents a different part of the country. And that, of course, is a key to warning us about civil war. If certain parts of the country gain at the expense of others and others are left out, it's an early warning sign. And we like early warning signs because we could theoretically do something about the conflict and prevent it. But we don't often act. It's not easy to act. So, and then the last thing about it is globalized networks. Globalized networks affecting these wars, such as uh, IT, the use of information technology, the use of new networking, uh, uh, twittering uh, kinds of approaches to coordinating struggles across countries. The Sri Lankan civil war went on so long partly because they taxed Sri Lankans living abroad. They taxed um, um, Sinhalese. Sorry, the Tamils tax Tamils living abroad to bring money back to buy arms. International networks of support to keep the struggle going. And uh, we find this to be the case in many wars today. So conditions of nationalism and resistance to outsiders are seen in such wars. Conditions that we can encounter in Iraq and Afghanistan in their histories. Complex, lo lo complex local ethnicities and relationships. So here is where the difficulty of hard power uh, uh, arises. Yes, you can bring a lot of force to bear, but the use of relatively primitive devices, such as incendiary devices, the IEDs, the improvised incendiary bombs at the roadside, caused havoc with advanced equipment and mechanized forces that the United States can bring to bear. It's a primitive form of struggle by the weak, asymmetrical struggle, but it keeps the pot boiling. It makes it hotter for the invader or the controller or the intervener to prevail. And sooner or later, the feeling is that the intervener has to realize that it's not quite a winnable political situation and make, uh, and make adjustments. Um, Peace building requires negotiated outcomes. And I want to point out that the Americans should know this. The United States was founded, according to the historian David Hackett Fisher, as an inter-ethnic bargain between four Anglo-Saxon communities who had migrated to these shores. And he argues in his book on American constitutional history that the United States is an, the Constitution is an ethnic bargain between the, let me see if I remember them all, the Massachusetts Bay colonists coming from a certain part of England, we call them Puritans, I suppose that's a misnomer, the New York settlements uh, in, in New York State, uh, in the people that settled there from a different part of the country, uh, the Virginia planters, and the hill country people of Tennessee and Kentucky, Scots-Irish. 
And his analysis of the American Constitution is very interesting. It's, it's a bargain which keeps these powers all having a, a domain, and, and a domain that they can count on. So today we have a Senate where everybody's represented by two, and I'll overlook the fact that it doesn't ever get anything done anymore. Uh, it is a bargain situation that has kept the, 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 the opening to inter-ethnic relationships at least uh, workable. And he argues that the advent of new ethnic communities in this country by immigration over the three centuries, and the advent of civil rights, and the advent of all kinds of new participants in our, in our Constitution is premised on the fact that it is an ethnic bargain. It's a bargain situation. So uh, that should be familiar to anybody who has been over here in the nearby city of Chicago, right? Americans should know a little bit about Iraq from knowing something about Chicago. Uh, not pretty sometimes, the, uh, the machine the machine politics of Chicago, and some resent it as a uh, overbearing uh, single party state, shall we say. There's patronage, there's distribution of wealth, there's bargains between neighborhoods, but my goodness, it sort of works, sort of. And the thing goes on, fairly prosperous city. Uh, and so when you came to Iraq, it was argued you should have probably expected something more akin to Chicago than the view, the easy view that we could implant democracy right away, which we seem to have about that situation. And I blame my own, my own discipline, by the way, for foisting this notion of democratic peace. Uh, the, uh, the theory of the democratic peace is that two democracies don't fight each other in history. And my, my colleagues in, in international relations have analyzed a lot of historical cases and they quibble about, for instance, was Germany a democracy in World War I or not? Was Britain a democracy in World War I or not? I mean, you can, you can question some of this stuff. Who could vote? Could women vote, for instance, in some of these countries that supposedly were democracies? You know, they didn't, the answer was no for a long time, you know? And so the question about democracy is definitional, but we think that when their two countries were de are democratic, there's less tendency for them to fight each other for various reasons. They fight others, they fight other people, but they seemingly don't fight each other. And because of that, I think Washington sort of glommed onto that finding. And I believe came to think that if we can simply build democracies in, in mo most of these rogue and difficult countries like Iraq, by my goodness, there'll be peace. They'll even make peace with Israel, because Israel's a democracy, Iraq will be a democracy. What better situation? And it went flying in the face, I think, of some of these local pe peculiarities and local cultural traditions, which make it not quite apparent that countries are adopting uh, a, a system readily. Uh, some people point out to Japan and Germany as fine examples of implanted democracy. Well, both of them are getting a test right now in the form of very difficult economic situations. And let's hope that they are implanted well. We think they are. But there is certain disillusionment that people have sometimes with situations where economics or some other factors get out of control. So um, the question is, how do you negotiate these things? If you're going to have bargained agreements, how do you negotiate them? Um, just quickly, let me put up this map that I promised uh, that I wanted. And uh, the World Affairs Council people so kindly obliged. Um, this is a situation of great complexity. This is an area of great complexity. The United States has seen it and sees it as crucial because it is the zone from which the Al Qaeda forces were trained in Afghanistan and somewhat into Pakistan. And that border zone, uh, I don't know if I have it, yeah, I do. This border zone, of course, uh, is the key area where 
forces are holed up. Now, the problem is the politics. The problem is the politics and the local politics, which is often born on the, on the wings of, of tribal and clan traditions. Uh, let's see if I can keep the scorecard straight. At the end of the, um, well, let's see. Let, let me pick this up when the United States under the Bush administration in an attempt to rout Al Qaeda and the Taliban invades the country in the early uh, 2001, 2002, and drives the Taliban uh, away. The Taliban had come to power previously as a puritanical cure, it was seen in Afghanistan, for the corruption of tribal groups that struggled with each other after the Soviet Union left and was defeated in the late 1970s. And we have to think back, it's like an onion skin, peeling back the histor historical uh, situation. Afghanistan was started as a country in the 18th century as a resistance to British imperialism in the area. The British controlled, as we can know from our history, they controlled India. They also controlled uh, a good bit of the other territories uh, to the west in uh, the Arab world. And the Afghani princes decided that they would resist. And they effectively resist the British, resisted the British. British came upon some of their first most difficult military defeats in trying to extend the Raj up into Afghanistan. And these mountain redoubts held out and maintained independence. But that didn't mean they were unified under a single uh, uh, ruling system. It meant that there was a complex interrelationship among princely ruling clan ruling elites. Um, down to the 20th century, so the British had been resisted. The Soviets come along in the 1970s in an effort, much like ours in Vietnam, to forestall the fall of a favored regime in Afghanistan, which had overthrown the king and had established the Socialist Republic, backed by the Soviet Union, which of course was nearby. At that time, these territories were all part of the Soviet Union. And the Soviets eventually had to send troops, much as we did to Saigon, they sent troops to try to keep their favorite regime in power. That regime, by the way, had liberalized to the extent that women were professional, that schools were widespread, and that what we would call modern uh, social practices had taken root as opposed to traditional uh, cultural social, social practices in the region. Uh, as we know, the Americans beginning with Jimmy Carter, oddly enough, and going on through the Reagan administration, reacted very negatively to the Soviet presence in Afghanistan and resisted it. Uh, interestingly enough, at the very moment that the Soviets were purporting to want to help us with a difficult situation in Iran, where our diplomats had been kidnapped. But the Carter administration decided that the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan was a bigger threat than Soviet help might be to get our diplomats out of Iran at the Iranian Revolution. And they opposed the Soviet Union. We went for, at that time, 1980, one of our big uh, oppositions to the Soviets was to boycott the Moscow Olympics. We're, we're at Olympic time now, so I want to talk about how Olympics are some symbolic thing. So we, we did oppose them they retaliated at the Los Angeles Olympics. And so you have it, Olympic politics. Anyway, um, that was a long struggle where we armed the opposition groups, the so-called Mujahideen, who were tribal, traditional elements, mostly coming from the north, uh, or sorry, people who had uh, uh, derivations similar to Uzbeks and Tajiks and the west. And we also uh, supported some of, the, some of the Pushtun tribes. These are different language groups. They speak Dari in the west, they speak Pushtun in the east. Again, held together often by fear of outsiders, fighting each other most of the other times. Um, the Soviets were the outsiders. They held together as Mujahideen, the United States supplied them. The Reagan administration takes credit for defeating the Soviet Union. And of course, in the process, we 
supplied and sent in a certain character whose name we then later got to know better, a certain fellow from Saudi Arabia by the name of Osama bin Laden, who uh, was treated by American uh, intelligence as a way to further the cause against the Soviets because he had tremendous organizational skills. And so American aid went to bin Laden. We know the ultimate result of that it was not what we would have hoped in the long term. But the Soviets were defeated. The, the country near, uh, soon fell into civil war with these same tribal groups going at each other again. And out of that, refugees, young men who had fled the war, ended up in Pakistan in, tri in uh, training schools and became this force that we learned then to call the Taliban. Puritanical, unremitting, inflexible about restora restoration of Islamic honor and good government in the terms of getting rid of corruption, Western corruption. Uh, very much at the expense of women uh, and girls in schools, very much at the expense of what the West would consider human rights. So Taliban rule. We then invaded in uh, retaliation to the Al-Qaeda. The Clinton administration had dealings with the Taliban to a degree earlier over the issue of possible oil pipelines coming through this region. Again, it's a very tangled web of politics, folks, that we're trying to deal with when we're doing peacemaking and history. Um, the uh, Taliban was driven out, temporarily at least, by United States forces on their first run through, but we didn't get Al Qaeda. People re these people retreated to the mountain passes. Uh, quick enough response was not made. Uh, CIA people tell us they could have gotten them, but were not allowed to, and uh, because of Pakistan's interest. And what is Pakistan's interest? Pakistan had backed the Taliban, plain and simple. They thought it was a way of extending their control, their influence to their regional neighbor. They had helped train the Taliban in those schools. And at the behest of the United States, they did a 180. They reversed themselves, very difficult in their position at the behest of the Bush administration to take a counter Taliban position, but only so far. The local politics of these areas requires that you sort of balance things out Chicago style. And you don't want to quite do away with your tribal allies because they might come down and attack you. And Pakistan's army might be split by tribal loyalties. And for a long time, and you had President Musharraf, I think, address this council a couple of years ago. Uh, that's a delicate balancing, balancing act when you rule Pakistan. Ask Mrs. Uh, Bhutto's family about that, about how dangerous this can be. So when the outside power puts pressure on to change positions, it has ramifications throughout a country's whole structure. Pakistan is not blameless in any of this. They, they export a certain amount of revolution to Indian territory to try to keep the Indians preoccupied. They've evidently also exported nuclear materials to North Korea. But they're still our allies. What do you do with your allies? You know, sometimes you're stuck with your allies, right? Saudi Arabia is a close, co close collaborating state, but we're a little bit leery of some of the stuff that they've allowed to happen. And often these states want to keep the extremists out of the capital city and away from them, so they let them operate in the remote zones. So peacemaking is a very complicated, difficult, situ difficult and, and um, arduous task to try to formulate these, these bargains. And I would leave you with the notion that that is sort of where we're headed at the moment, moving toward negotiations. Yes, we have a sort of a mini surge going on in Afghanistan. We have the troop commitments in Helmand province to the south. Uh, we're attempting in the south of Kabul and going toward the east. The big one will be in, um, uh, starts with a K. I'm blocking the name of the town. Uh, the, uh, 
on the province. Kandahar, thank you very much. Kandahar will be the big test because that is the stomping ground of the Taliban. That's the push to in tribal area. The Taliban represents the 40, would like to represent the 40% of the country that are Pushtuni in ethnic backgrounds. They are, that's the major single ethnic community. Now the others, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, the, the Iranian speaking people, the Dari speaking Persian, pretty much a dialect of Persian, are also to be contended with and they are now the ruling powers in an uneasy alliance with each other that we call the Northern Alliance. And that is the, uh, the Karzai faction. But to have it really stick, you have to find willing Pushtuns to join in that, in that ruling government. And mo many analysts think that the Bush administration, sorry, the Obama administration, even as it attempts a hard power push to clear some of these zones and territories, and by the way, in the process, a, again, alienates people. Today, a misplaced bombing, killing five. The other day, a misplaced rocket, killing 12 civilians. Creates a situation where you have two steps forward and one step back in terms of people's responses on the ground and the hearts and the minds problem. But it is an attempt to use the hard power to clear a zone, conspicuously clear it, and at least have a presence there for a while so that people can get to trust presumably trust the security that they're being offered. But in the process, we're also told, look behind the scenes, because feelers are out, to try to engage leaders in the Taliban, even up to the possible level of Mullah Omar, who is the titular leader of the Taliban, to see if a bargain can't be struck where a coalition of some sort is formed. Stranger things have happened. Who would have thought the IRA would be sitting with Ian Paisley's people in some sort of parliament in Northern Ireland? It can happen because of outside pressure. It can happen because of inducements. The European Union inducing Ireland and the potential for prosperity if it can solve its conflict. It can happen if it's in people's interest. The Obama people are trying to up the stakes to where it's in their interest to get us out, well, the only way to get us out is to make a deal. We'll see if that can work. We're not sure of this strategy. It's an interesting strategy because even in the approach that Joe Biden, uh, Joseph Biden wants to follow, there are difficulties. He wants to stress, for instance, intelligence work and the use of drone aircraft to drop bombs on the leadership of the Taliban or the leadership of Al-Qaeda where they find them. The interesting thing about that is though that much of this is farmed out to companies. There's a good deal of um, use of private contractors in how we fight our wars these days in the hard power end of things. And that creates a, co a somewhat of a coordination problem. We're told that the actual flight of the drones is controlled by contractors but the permission to actually fire depends on the Pentagon and Langley for permission. So what happens is the drones take pictures for two, three hours over a target to see if the right guy is there, his family, or whatever is, and there won't be too many neighbors killed, sends the, sends the photos and the, and the cartography back to Washington for review, computerized routines that judge the benefits and the costs of actually unleashing a bomb, and then the permission is either given or withheld. Somewhat similar, the Israelis do quite a bit the same thing in Gaza, even with more pro, uh, supposedly more prohibitions and, and limitations on when you can actually fire. But it's an interesting intermeshing of private and public now in how the war is conducted in the hard power area which will determine to a great degree what can be done along this border area with Pakistan or not. Now, it so happens that the overstepping in Pakistan by the Al-Qaeda groups and their breaking of a deal with the Pakistani government to come down into the Swat Valley, 
and actually attack a few of the Pakistani cities in the Paswat Valley to send a signal to Islamabad created a willingness on the part of the Pakistani government to actually go and fight up there, to actually send troops and fight these guys up in the mountain areas. Again, we're not sure what can be achieved because they retreat into the mountains and are gone. But the Pakistanis turned away from the Indian border for a while and were willing to move up and actually fight these, these folks. So this is a difficult and treacherous kind of politics. People and leaders get killed in these politics, both by the outsiders and the insiders. And this is unfortunately the reality of peacemaking. Uh, some would anal anal analogize it to sausage making. You don't want to see it, but you, you, you do want to try to appreciate the outcome. So let's hope we can. Thank you very much. I'll uh, turn it over to you. All right, we do have some time for questions, and there are a couple of mics roaming around up here if you have some questions. What an education, I think, uh, on what's going on in the world. And, uh, yep, right over here. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming, Doctor. Um, my question is, do you consider the surge an actual traditional hard power because of the community building that it does, or is it a, a mixture of the two? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's not a tradition, it's not quite traditional. Uh, we got notice a couple of years ago from NATO forces that you can't just fight in these zones. You have to try to create a better situation for the people living in these territories. Otherwise, they will... The question for winning insurgency is, will the people tolerate the insurgents? Not necessarily support the insurgents, but will they tolerate them as, better, as a better bet than the outsiders? And our NATO partners, particularly the British and the Canadians, began counseling that they didn't think you can carry this off without some sort of better performance in nation building or village building. One of my former students, a former Marine Corps colonel, who did his PhD with us at Wayne State, and then went on to his, he wrote his dissertation on the Iraqi reconstruction projects. And as you know, the, we did do a lot of reconstruction in Iraq. I mean, it's not as if we went in there with simply armed forces. So we knew this already. He did a quick, you know, actually Lawrence of Arabia quick kind of tour of the desert in a Humvee to look at as many reconstruction projects as he could possibly find to figure out what worked. What was actually working in the reconstruction zones? And this ranged from schools to hospitals to water purification to electricity plants. This was 2008. He found one of these types actually operating. And he went north and south in Iraq. And the type of reconstruction that actually worked, can you guess, was schools. Schools was the only one he could find which were actually operating because he concluded to build a school is rather simple. You build a building, it can be one or two rooms, you find a teacher, you have a school. Hopefully the school doesn't get attacked, but you have an operated, operative school. We had the most advanced water purification system that you would find in Cleveland. I don't know, Cle Cleveland is water purification. And up to date, top of the line. When he visited it, after a year of sitting there, it was inoperable. It was inoperable. And he, and he found out why. It required a highly qualified production engineer to run the plant. They had people like that in Baghdad. A water purification engineer, fully trained, they had people like that in Baghdad. The only problem was, this was in an area controlled by a local sheikh, one of our allies, because one of the things we did in Iraq to create a better situation than the surge even was to align ourselves with willing sheikhs who would put down the insurgents. The local sheikh wanted the plant to be run by his brother-in-law. So what are you going to do? You know. So the plant doesn't operate. Not only that, it tied down two or three divisions to, to guard the thing while it was inoperable. 
So here is one of the great problems of Reconstruction. You're trying it in the middle of war with people who may or may not fit the mold of what you're trying to do. Same for electricity generation. Same for, um, um, you know, the other big time projects. We, we, we tend to bring good things, folks. We're high tech and we like to be constructive for people. We like to bring a better world for people. Lyndon Johnson once offered the Tennessee Valley Authority to the North Vietnamese. Really, he did. He, he, he couldn't understand why they turned it down. Why would those folks not want the TVA on the Mekong? And the fact is it didn't fit. Didn't fit the politics. So that's a, that, it, we are trying different. The pro, and we are trying a mixed approach. And, I, and you got to give credit to that, but will it be enough? That's, that's a key question. I have two questions. First, didn't Joe Biden propose for Iraq a division in three different countries, three different emirates, like? And the second. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Could you say? Didn't Joe Biden propose a division of Iraq? in three regions, ah, yeah. similar to the Emirates uh, uh, co-government or something like that. And the second, how would you describe the situation in Colombia? Hmm. Very interesting. I'm not an expert on Colombia. I'll give you my, my impression in a minute. But at first on Iraq, the question being, uh, didn't Joe Biden and some others recommend the actual division of the country into three, a Sunni, a Shia, and a Kurdish zone. Uh, I think he did. And the feeling was, and I think the Iraqis in general, recognize that they do have a state. Now, the Kurds may be the least attached to that state because they want, have wanted a state of their own, a nation state of Kurdistan. They have settled for a, what they call a Kurdistan province in the north. There is a great deal of still, con there is some conflict. It's a fairly stable region because they have controlled it pretty effectively. But there's a lot of insurgency going on about that, uh, I think it's Kirkuk, which is the town uh, with a lot of oil resources and whether it should be part of that province or not. And the Sunni of Iraq have been dealt low in the oil resources in the water resources too, but in the, in the oil resources, the oil revenues have not been officially figured that could include and, and satisfy the majority of, of Sunnis who are a minority of the country, former rulers. So the, one of the obvious solutions is partition it into three, hoping that maybe they'd form a federation of some kind, a confederation, a loose federation, and stay sort of together. But most Iraqis of all sorts would not like to see the country divided along those lines. It's remarkable because the country was artificial when it was formed by the British, as were so many countries formed by the British, particularly in the Middle East, after the First World War. Um, but there is Iraqi nationalism. And yet, of course, there are these regional sectional divisions. So what we've ended up with is a decentralized type of government in Iraq where the Prime Minister Malaki uh, tries to keep them in line but gr gives a great deal of local uh, control uh, is given to these regions. Uh, it's sort of a necessity. Uh, but, but Biden felt that actually it should be divided and I think that went against most of the thinking uh, particularly uh, uh, among the neighbors of Iraq. And one thing I didn't get a chance to mention, by the way, oh, I'm sorry, in the, in the, um, gotta get the map back. Can I get it back? Oh, there it is. Uh, the neighbors, the neighbors. Notice that there are some very influential neighbors in this region, one of whom is kind of interesting over here. Today, Hillary Clinton saying that this country seems to be bound uh, toward becoming a military dictatorship. Uh, sort of not what I would have characterized it becoming, but at any rate, we seem to be on a, a, certainly a negative course with Iran over the nuclear issue. 
and some other concerns about the spread of terror support. We understand that. Problem, though, is Iran basically backs the side in Afghanistan that we back. Isn't that unusual? They basically back the anti-Taliban forces of Afghanistan. <clears throat> Pakistan are the ones who have traditionally backed the Taliban. Iran has much more ethnically in common with the tribal uh, uh, Dari-speaking tribes to the west and has opposed that. Now, when George Bush came into Afghanistan, Mar Americans may or may not be aware, but we held a summit, uh, was sort of a summit meeting of the region. And we invited influential powers, Pakistan, Russia, Iran, Britain, and the United States, to discuss what they have in common and common ground about Afghanistan and the potential for stabilizing the country. This is another form of peacemaking, peace building, you might say. And it's going to be necessary again, strangely enough. There are needs that the United States and Iran have for each other. For instance, one thing Iran notes, where are American forces? Well, American forces are in Afghanistan, and where else? Over here in Iraq. Not showing on the map, but if you're a security manager in Tehran, you notice that you're surrounded. So there is a certain interest, potential, in Iran as to how long and in what circumstance the Americans stay and what is the outcome. And then there's an interest in Washington that, yes, he'd like to get out of Afghanistan, but uh, hey, you know, it's interesting that we have Iran on two sides. So these things are a little bit complicated by the regional situation. Now, you asked about Colombia. Colombia is a country that, of course, has been racked by uh, various uh, conflicts, all, also including drugs, the drug trafficking business. And I mentioned the new wars having to do with trafficking. Uh, Mary Caldor likens new wars in some respects to cr criminal syndicates. There's a certain aspect of criminality about some of the new war situations. Who controls some of these illegal and lucrative economies? It's true of Afghanistan. Afghanistan has a very uh, persistent poppy trade, which supplies the income necessary by otherwise destitute farmers. Now, at certain, <laughs> interestingly, the, the government that actually relieved the poppy trade most recently was the Taliban government when it was in power. They banned the trade of poppies. Now they're all in favor of it. They use it. They make deals with the poppy farmers to get uh, trade and arms. So it's, you know, it, it depends on where you stand, where you sit is where you stand, so to speak. Uh, and the Taliban is not above making practical uh, 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 deals. Now, Colombia, uh, I don't know the latest on the government situation. I think the drug trafficking cartels have spread beyond Colombia. They've ravaged, uh, they've ravaged Mexico in the last year or two. And there is also the uh, rural insurgency that has gone on in Colombia. But my impression is the situation is somewhat better than in, in, the, in prior, prior years. I think that the government got a lot of backing from the United States and has established a certain modicum of order, but again, uh, the actual uh, total effectiveness of the peace, I think I would question. Uh, nevertheless, they uh, seem to be a little less in the headlines about uh, instability. Maybe you know more than I do about that question. Uh, against the original goal and wouldn't it legitimize them as a like an authority in, in the region and then when we do that wouldn't it leave all the people who live under the bad conditions 
because of the peace that's been formed? Very good questions. You know, if you make peace with the Taliban, will it not legitimize difficult conditions and bad conditions for the people and go against what the war was about? Well, that depends on what the deal is, of course, and whether there is any progress in containing the Al-Qaeda training grounds and Al-Qaeda forces. By the way, we know that Al-Qaeda has spread outside of Afghanistan. We know that it probably isn't the major place where Al-Qaeda has located, if it's located anywhere. It's a very dispersed network. Yemen seems to be a place. Somalia seems to be a place. I'm sure there are some others. Nigeria was a, uh, evidently a uh, origin place for the latest uh, bombing uh, attempt over Detroit. So uh, what we have to be concerned about is failed states. And I think that accepting the Taliban into government and creating a government that might hold in Afghanistan and then evolve is the best hope we can have of a bad situation in some respects. Uh, that's not to say that they have to be put into power completely. They will not be able to rule the country completely themselves either. They've been weakened to the point uh, that they're not sustainable in the same way they were in 2003, 2002, 2003. So each side will have to um, give something, and I'm not sure the Taliban leadership is ready to do that. Uh, they may see themselves as in a strong position still. One of the theories about when civil wars end, by the way, is the so-called stalemate theory. The theory is hurting stalemates. Hurting stalemates. Not just a stalemate, but a stalemate that really starts costing both sides. It's already costing us. It's already costing the Afghan government. If it can get to the point, I think this is probably what the Obama people are trying to do with this surge. If it can get to the point of materially hurting the Taliban, making it costly, they're considered rational actors, you see. Insurgents often are. The Sunni insurgents in Iraq were uprising because they had lost power at the expense of the majority Shia, Shia who they had previously repressed. There was a reason behind that. It didn't just come from craziness, although there's an element of craziness involved in all such activity. So if you can get at some of those interests and create a situation where they're held accountable in some real respect, let's say that they agree to international uh, um, um, peacekeeping in the country, at least observers, uh, some progress is made. And over time, as with China, as with other countries, the erosion of their um, inflexibility begins to take place. In Iran, we see that there's protest. It may be moving to a military situation, but it's not there in, in, in respect. I think what Hillary Clinton is really saying is that they want to have, in Iran, they want to have embargoes that would hit the Revolutionary Guards, who they think are in charge of the uh, nuclear policy. And so they're trying to legitimize in the UN Security Council actions which would attack, uh, not directly, but uh, through uh, embargo and boycott the Revolutionary Guards and their supposed control. Now, I don't know whether that's gonna be effective, but it's, attempt, it's an attempt to convince the Security Council and China. So, yes, it's not pretty, it's not what we would prefer, but realists would say you deal with what you get and you make the best of it if you can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we so appreciate what what a great uh, experience to have uh, exposure to this kind of knowledge here in Grand Rapids. I'm so glad that you took advantage. Thank you very much. This evening. <laughs> Next lecture is February 22nd. It will be Dr. Eric Larson of the RAND Institute from Santa Monica talking about Iran, Iraq, oil, terrorism, and the U.S. <laughs> and the Persian Gulf. So I know you'll want to be here for that. Um, just once again on the Wayne State University program that Dr. Pearson mentioned earlier, the Graduate Certificate in Peace and Security Studies, uh, if you want to add to your graduate program there, please fill out your ballot. And thank you for coming this evening. Drive home safely.
mic, sorry. Went out a little too long. Sorry. Oh, don't worry about that. No, it's great. I think everybody was riveted. This is yours. So everybody, like everybody <laughs> spills over into the next topic, I guess. Oh, oh, no, 